Constructions. Well, gone wrong. Listen to me very carefully. I'm going to give you things that were products of corruption, incompetence, and plain obliviousness. Getting double tapped by Boeings is not one of those things. Special thanks to the fallen infrastructures for this video. Sampung department store collapse. Now about 99% of the things on this list, if not all, will involve something collapsing, because that is simply what happens if an infrastructure wasn't built soundly. Anyway, the Sampung department store in Seoul, South Korea, was made in the late 1980s by the Sampung Group, and it was a branch of another plan of the group to build a commercial complex. You know, all that taking advantage of the economic boom to give us Gangnam Style and boy bands with seven members that look like each other, just with different hair colors. So the first idea was to build this structure to be an office building to probably give the population of South Korea something to do. But the chairman Lee Jun just waltzed in and said, okay, I have decided we will no longer make an office for this. We will make a department store. Then the construction people were probably like, what the actual hell? We're already in the middle of making the building and you're saying that just now? Since the idea was so absurd in terms of timing, you might think that this sudden change of heart of the capitalist was fine because it's not like the workers had to change much of the structure, but you're wrong. One of the changes that the construction team had to do was to add another floor where a traditional Korean restaurant was going to be built on. Doing that is not as easy as breathing. From the top, they had to make it drop because going commercial would need escalator installations and such. Another thing was the team had to remove several support columns to give more space for shops. By doing the math, you add another floor of heavy weight to a structure with a weakened support for capitalism, and then add escalators. The answer is simple, and I'll even use a JoJo reference for this. Break down, break down. The problems didn't end there. The building had a flat slab design originally, meaning it didn't have steel frames in it, and each floor relied on the columns for support. Less support for more floors plus a 45 freaking ton air conditioner on the roof? Yeah, not a good combination. Okay, now we have the problems for the building. The snowball effect of this started when the original contractor said nope to the idea because of how unsafe the proposal was. Sampoon Group weren't having any of that cause, it's all about the money, 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 so they hired a different contractor instead. This time, it was a yes man who willingly followed what they wanted. The building was done, and everyone, I welcome you to the all new Sampoon department store. What could possibly go wrong? The mall became a quick hit for people. For five years straight, Sampung department store operated well without anything to mind in the world but profit. You can't get away with a substandard building for long. It's bound to show that it's about to get effed quickly, and quickly it did show. The large cracks that appeared in the ceiling of the fifth floor screamed, I'm about to fall. These cracks by all means were scary. Wait, they're scary? Sir, is this scary? Don't ask me. I'm just here to get my share. You, you don't think that's... Oh my goodness. Well, that lack of judgment will cost them big not long from now. The day was June 29, 1995. Structural engineers were called to check the condition of the mall, yada yada yada. Can you see these cracks? We need to take action on this. I wasn't asking for that. I was asking if these damages would stop making me money. I'm gonna hold your hand when I say this, but you have the wrong person. The management thought everything was fine, and asked employees to cover up the cracks with sealants and put the sellable items in the basement. It was in fact, not fine. At about 5 p.m., the fifth floor ceiling started to sag like Michael Jackson's baby dangling over the balcony. Whoop, says the employees to the customers. You're not allowed here anymore. It's closed. Go back to the shoes section. Thanks. The store was still open after all the biggest red flag that the mall was about to crumble. There were more or less 1,500 people in the mall when at around 5.52 p.m., Sampung department store echoed loud cracks all throughout the building. In a split second, employees blared out the alarms to evacuate everyone off the building. Everyone was panicking, and there's only so much the store employees could do to keep 1,500 shoppers safe in an orderly fashion. In less than 20 seconds after the cracking, the roof collapsed. Remember what was on the roof? Yeah, a 45-ton air conditioning system. Everything started to chain fall until the entire south wing just got pancaked to the basement. Want to see how it looked like? Here you go. It looked like someone took a bite out of it. 1,500 people got trapped, 502 got final destination, and 937 were badly injured. The rescue efforts lasted for 17 days, and even close to the end of it, people were still being rescued alive, like the 19-year-old clerk Park Sung-hyun who survived 17 days by drinking rainwater that's falling from the rubble. 
The chairman Lee Jun and his son were sentenced with 10 and a half years for Lee Jun and 7 years for his son. But let's be honest, that time wasn't enough. Fidene Amphitheater The Fidene Amphitheater was asked to be made by Attilius, this guy, in the year 27. Yep, 27, not even full three digits in. Attilius used to be a Roman slave, and now he's dead. But before he died, he became a former slave who wanted to take advantage of the Roman people's love for entertainment. Ancient Romans find it amusing to watch people die, so they especially liked watching gladiatorial games. But again, when profit comes first before quality, nothing good really comes out of it. The same thing can be said in Attilius's case. Speed over quality for faster profit meant that he had to build the amphitheater with wood instead of stone or concrete. Well, to be fair, wood is also strong, but not as sturdy as concrete back in those times. I mean, have you seen the remains of the Colosseum right now? It's still standing like Elton John. But I guess Attilius wanted to build his Rome in a day. The foundation of the amphitheater also wasn't on some stiff and dense ground with reinforcement and all that. I don't know, but it was either that the Romans were completely ignorant of how Attilius made this place, they didn't care, or Attilius advertised the amphitheater good enough to make it look presentable on the day of the opening. All of the above, perhaps? But on the ribbon cutting, tens of thousands of Romans gathered to the amphitheater to see what's poppin'. What was it that the theater had to get this many people? LED lights, blaring speakers, celebrity cameos, whatever it was, it sure as hell worked. As the endless waves of people scrambled to find seats, the sheer collective weight of them was too much for the entire amphitheater, as it began with the wood cracking loudly. The claps turned to screams, and the entire thing collapsed with most people getting buried in whatever high-quality build Attilius had in his structure. The emperor that time Tiberius heard about this news and said, God damn it, I put myself to rule in isolation and a slave matched Caligula's nasty? How many people got trapped under this amphitheater? About 40,000 to 60,000, sir. What? If my math is right, that's eight and a half times more than what Leonidas had in his last battle. Your math is right, sir. It's amazing you can do math that fast. You know what? Let's fly there and help this get as many people as we can out. But I want them alive. Go! So they went there for Tiberius to personally supervise the rescue. Valiant effort, but they saved less than half of the total spectators and 20 to 50,000 people died under the rubble of the structure. The Senate banned people with poor financial decisions from making things like this again after that. As for Attilius, do you see him anywhere? Like here? Here? Or maybe here? No? Probably because he was exiled, or in John Wick terms, excommunicado. St. Francis Dam. This is William Mulholland the chief engineer of the Los Angeles Bureau of Waterworks and Supply in the 1920s, the time when the population was starting to boom and economies starting to crash. With the surge in babies came the need for more clean water. LA never had that big of a reservoir to supply 576,000 citizens with clean water on the daily, so Mulholland had to make another one. He planned the new reservoir to be in the big Tujunga Canyon at first. He canceled the plan because it was too expensive to build it there. Then he continued this plan to be in San Francisco Canyon, the same place he didn't consider because of problems with the soil. Hey, whatever. Either that, or let half a million people die from dehydration. So there we go, he started the St. Francis Dam in 1924 and finished it in 1926. Well, he, he didn't do the actual building, but you already know that one if you have common sense. The St. Francis Dam stood at 62 and a half meters or 205 feet. This was higher than the original 185, but it was made taller without increasing the width of the base. That's a big no-no if we're talking about physics. Must be, the taller the height, the wider the base. That's how it's supposed to work, or else, you fall. During the process of building this goddamn dam, came the fact that they used substandard concrete mixtures above all other things. Nevertheless, they continued building the dam and began filling it with water on the 1st of March, 1926. By the 7th of March, 1928, it was almost at full capacity, but five days later, the keeper, Tony Harnishush, shush, shush, Jesus Christ, that name. Tony Harnishfager saw a massive leak on the west end of the dam. Oh no, a leak. Not good. That's not what Mulholland and his assistant Harvey Van Norman said. They said everything was A-OK. -okay. Everything was, in fact, not A-OK. -okay. Before midnight of the 12th of March, the dam collapsed and boomed 12.4 billion gallons of water. This water traveled 54 miles to the Pacific Ocean, destroying everything it touched. From the towns of Castaic, Saugus, Fillmore, Santa Paula, to Satakoy. What a massive squirt. 
It was sad that one of the first people to lose their lives here were the caretaker, Tony Harnischfeger, his girlfriend, and their child. About 400 people died in this instance that could have been prevented had they just found a better solution on how to build the dam. Tacoma Narrows Bridge Collapse The Tacoma Narrows Bridge was a bridge, yep, point to point. This crosses the Tacoma Narrows Strait of Puget Sound in Washington. Engineer Clark Eldridge of the Washington Department of Highways made the blueprint for this bad boy and gave an estimation that it would cost about $11 million. His plan really had that engineer level of engineering with the truss system to keep the bridge deck stable. That, my friends, is the end of the good times. When he looked for federal funding, the project was yeeted to Leon Moiseif, a suspension bridge designer who wanted a cheaper bridge at the expense of safety. Moiseif won the battle, but not the war. The bridge opened in July of 1940, and to no surprise, it was the third longest bridge in the world at that time. The bridge got its nickname, Galloping Gertie, because it moved when strong winds hit it. Hey, come on, it's a bridge designed to do just that. It'll hold, just believe? Nope, just nope. It was studied that the moving bridge wasn't natural for what it's made from, and Professor F. Bert Farquharson, which was a hard name to spell, suggested changes, but it wasn't done in time. So on the 7th of November 1940, when winds reached up to 42 miles an hour, the bridge going up and down was expected. That's the galloping Gertie bullcrap. What wasn't expected was the bridge twisting back and forth. This back and forth twisting became stronger when the solid plate girders in the bridge caught the winds. Thankfully, there were zero human deaths in this incident. Well, apart from local reporter Leonard Coatsworth, who was driving on the bridge when it started twisting, he didn't die. His dog Tubby did because Leonard had to abandon the car, plus Tubby was aggressive. Rip in peace, Tubby. Shanghai Lotus Riverside The Lotus Riverside complex was a part of Shanghai, China's attempt to take advantage of the fact that they're getting really populated and everyone could use a house, hence the apartment. Shanghai also wanted to show this in the 2010 World Expo. The Lotus Riverside complex had 11 blocks of 13-story apartment buildings, enough stories to get Ava Chris Tyson to smile. The building of this thing was managed by Shanghai Meidu Property Development Company, a company that is really, really close to the government officials. That alone should say something on what's about to happen to this structure. Shanghai Meidu wanted to cut the cost on things so that the profits would be like Tom Cruise shouting, show me the money, from Jerry Maguire. So what Shanghai Meidu did was hire cheap-ass construction firms like Shanghai Zhongxin Construction and Shengteng Foundations. With Shanghai Zhongxin being responsible for the construction work overall, and Shengteng for the foundations, I shouldn't be even explaining what they're supposed to work on, it's literally in their names. Anyway, so now the construction has started, and there was something that went wrong already. There was a decision to dig a 4.6 meter deep underground garage on one side, and then throw those dug up soil on the other side of the building. The earth mountain got to about 10 meters high. Yep, that high, and that amount of soil just gave the foundation beneath it more pressure than it should have. Add the fact that the rain saturated the ground. You know what? There were a lot of things that made this, the Lotus Riverside apartment, a massive fail, and the management just neglected it for quick profit. And 5.30 in the morning of 27th of June, 2009, lo and behold, the fallen Lotus. What's that? You want another angle? Okay, lo and behold, the fallen Lotus in another angle. If you're wondering why the building still fully looked like a building, it's because it fell sideways. It wasn't like the Sampung Mall in Korea where it fell down from top to bottom. This was like a wind blew on it and just fell that way. Xiao De Kun, a worker there collecting tools at that time, was unfortunately unfortunate to be the only casualty of this accident. What can you say? Apart from the Great Wall, made in China is made in China. After the accident, a huge part of the 620 units had already been sold. That fall scared the buyers, and of course, they had to be compensated for that cause they already paid for that. 20 Fenchurch Street This is the part where no collapse happened, so props to you. 20 Fenchurch Street is a commercial building in London's Finance Trust Fund. 6. 5. District The construction of the building started in 2004, when famous architect Raphael Vignoli's design was chosen by the Land Securities and Canary Wharf Group, the developers. In the original version, the design was 220 meters tall. The freak does that mean? 721 feet and 9 inches. Happy? Anyway, the developers were hesitant to accept that design simply because it was too tall and it could become a photobomber to the St. Paul's Cathedral. They ended up refusing the height and wanted it cut shorter to 160 meters. There was nothing wrong about it. The signature, curving out as the height goes up with a bulge style, was still there. 
The construction of this skyscraper started in 2009 with a sprinkle of canceling the project overall because of funding troubles and got completed in April of 2014. After all, 200 million pounds is not a little amount. The building had this curved design at the top for more space that can be rented. This proved the selling point of the project, but also the worst part of it all. The building had this design to curve outward at the top, which meant that there was a part of it that acted as a gigantic magnifying glass. This focused light beams on the streets right below the building. It couldn't possibly be that bad, is something you can say. But in September 2013, not even a time that the actual building was finished, a journalist from City AM fried an egg on the sidewalk, or as the English people call it, the pavement. Temperatures made by the magnifying glass of a building went as high as 117 degrees Celsius, and that's way past the boiling point of water and can melt things already. Around that same time, a parked Jaguar XJ got its body melted like butter and was damaged hard enough that the developers gave the owner 946 pounds to shut the hell up. Some goes for the other businesses surrounding the building. The intense heat from that light shattered tiles and burnt the doormats. It's very nice to burn pedestrians in a dystopian world, but this ain't a dystopian world. So scaffolding and sunshades were built to at least lessen the area of damage of this weapon of mass construction for the meantime. See what I did there? As it turned out, this wasn't the first time the architect Vignoli had this exact problem. His design with the Vidara Hotel in Vegas did the same. What other thing to blame a faulty design than one phenomenon? Global warming. The building got the prestigious Carbuncle Cup Award in 2015, an award for the worst buildings in the UK. Rana Plaza. This plaza was an eight-story commercial building in Savar, Bangladesh owned by this guy, Sohel Rana, who for all we know is a businessman who had more than a close connection with politicians in Bangladesh. Sohel Rana wanted this structure to be commercially used at first, but never mind that as he changed the purpose of the building from commercial to industrial. The reason? Profit, of course. Bangladesh in the early 2010s had this massive growth in the clothing industry, so they had to go where the money was flowing. Since Sohel Rana was Shane McMahon in his own right, he added more floors to the building and asked no one's opinion because it was his money being spent. Little did he know that he was a businessman, not an engineer or an architect. He's meant to give laughs that pay my bills off along with other people who do the same. Adding floors to a building is not his job. It also makes the structure weaker when you come to think of it because physics. Hang on a moment, am I, am I reading this correctly? He added the floors before the actual construction has started? So that means everything can be changed. Nice. Nope, not nice. The construction of the plaza started on a filled-in pond. If you want a weaker foundation than that, you can go to a Sephora near you. So we have the perfect start for a failure. The next step is to make sure that the materials were substandard. Nice. They did that too. Low quality cement, weak steel. Wow. They must think they're in Minecraft creative to think this would go well. Since Sohel Rana has close ties with politicians during this time, no building code, enforcer, or authority batted an eye on how crappy this building and how crappy it's gonna get in the next few seconds. Days before the inevitable happened, the worker saw cracks in the walls of the building. Hey, what is this? It's a crack. What do you think is that? Exactly, it's a crack. Why are we even working when there's a crack in there? I just also work here, man. If you have a problem, you're gonna have to take it to the sky that the problem doesn't happen. What the? On the 23rd of April, 2013, these cracks became more obvious that everyone working in the building was evacuated. Engineers got called to be the voice of reason. But come on, we all know they ain't doing nothing when the owner of the plaza wants money. So Hel Rana said it was safe for work, and he even threatened the workers that he won't pay them if they don't return to work immediately. The workers did return the next morning since there was a ton of work they had to finish. But that's the bad part, they returned to work. Because at 8.57 in the morning of that same day, the building gave out, collapsed, and let's just say, the building spoke for itself that Sohel Rana was wrong about everything from start to finish. It crumbled under the weight of so many machines inside it, including a ton of generators in the upper floors because Bangladesh. This is what happens when businessmen become greedy. It might not look like a plaza, but it sure did trap more than 3,000 workers inside. What's stupid was that the United Nations actually wanted help with the rescue efforts, but this audacious government of Bangladesh said, nope, we'll take it from here, don't worry about us, we're fine, and left 100% of the work to the local government. That sort of didn't work, apart from the lack of proper equipment to move rubble like paper, they didn't have enough time. 
The last survivor Reshma was rescued after 17 days. That collapse that happened right there just left 1,134 people dead and about 2,500 injured. I guess build better things next time?